so beautiful and such truth. And I pray that we uh, get a glimpse. Paul knew of that love. He had never known of a love, and it changed him, and he was passionate. And I pray, no matter how long you've walked with the Lord, as we continue to go through Romans, we're going to know more of that love, and it's going to change us. Let's pray. What a perfect worship song, a love that knows no borders, knows no walls, the things that we may wonder, what was Paul getting at? That's what we rest in. That is truth. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That is the heart of God. So Lord, as we examine this beautiful chapter, chapter 9 in Romans, fill us with your spirit to understand more of this love that moved Paul so. May it move us as well by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. It was in 1990 that Jeff and I uh, first really knew of this love <laughs> um, of Christ. And we responded right away uh, when Pastor Greg gave that invitation. And so approaching in 1991, our first Easter celebration as believers, knowing really what the resurrection was all about. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Remember that we used to say that? Well, we heard that there was going to be um, an outreach at Pacific Amphitheater, and that was our first time around other believers in that setting. And so it was a Friday night, Good Friday service, and we went, and our new pastor, Pastor Greg Laurie, was going to be giving a message, and we were so changed by this love in such a short time, we wanted others to know about it. So Jeff invited one of his coworkers and his young wife, and they accepted the invitation, and we went to Pacific Amphitheater. And it, we got there kind of late on time before it started, but we sat at the very top, almost the last row, I remember, of the amphitheater, and worshiped the Lord. This was our first time in that type of a setting before, and Oh my, what a wonderful time of worship it was. And then we heard the message, the gospel message again, that was just as exciting to us. And then we shared communion, and that was our first time having communion with brothers and sisters in that environment. And then more worship. And then Pastor Greg gave the invitation. And I was so excited for our friends to respond to this invitation. And so he gives the invitation and they're still sitting in their seats. Jeff and I are both standing. And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe they don't know that it's gonna take a while to get down there. So I'm sitting next, well, standing and the wife is sitting there and I lean over and I said, it's gonna take you a while to get down there. You should probably go now. And she looks at me and I'm like, oh my, she really doesn't get it. <laughs> so anyway, um, nothing, no response. Well. Honestly, I could not understand how someone couldn't respond. So I went further. No kidding. I said, that pounding in your heart that you're feeling right now, that's the Holy Spirit, and you need to go forward. And nothing, nothing. I was so sad. I was so burdened. I was so perplexed. How could someone hear of the love of Christ and not respond to the message of salvation? Here I am 30 years later. Have I become complacent, cynical, lacking the urgency or the boldness to invite, to follow through, to encourage. What's my expectancy that God's able to break through stony hearts 
and bring someone into salvation? Where is my fervency in prayer for the lost, inviting, sharing, and then expecting that miraculous work of salvation? This chapter, Paul looks looks at part, Paul's heart for the lost and God's sovereignty in it all, in salvation. For Paul, when he penned this letter, he would have been saved about 25 years when he wrote this. But his strength, his boldness, his passion, it wasn't waning at all. He's not content in just knowing his own salvation. He wants to strengthen and encourage believers, and he wants the lost to be saved. Last week's message, chapter 8, the blessings we have in Christ, and Kathy's message, the best is yet to come. I wanted her to just keep teaching. You know, we groaned at, as she taught so beautifully what we have in Christ and the expectancy and the best is yet to come. You didn't want her to stop, did you? Everything in Paul's heart leapt as he penned that portion of chapter 8, that God works all things together for the good, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, but then here there's a change of tone the groanings of expectation that Paul had, the longings in chapter 8, are now the, the deepest groans of a broken heart, the most desperate groans of sorrow. Chapter 9, there's a shift in the mood. It's intensely personal for Paul. The unceasing anguish when he thinks about his kinsmen, the Jews. The enormous, deep pain within him that he's never free of. He loves his people so much. He knew unbelieving Israel would never know the fulfillment of the promises in the current state of rebellion. And this for him was heartbreaking beyond words. Paul wasn't at rest with the security that he himself had alone. He had a drive, a passion, a burden for the lost. And so as we look at this text this morning, I want to consider that burden Paul had for the lost, specifically for his fellow countrymen, the Jews. The title of my message, if you're taking notes this morning, is the sovereignty of God in salvation. And I have three points to my outline. I'll mention them now, but we'll, of course, get deeper into them. Number one, the burden. The burden that is placed on Paul, the burden that is placed on us in salvation. Number two, the backdrop. We're going to step back and see God's hand in the past. And then number three, the bottom line. God's power and work and our response in the offer of salvation. I'm going to read the first few verses of Romans 9, and I'm reading out of the ESV version. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. It is so. Number one, burden. Paul's burden. That's a God-given weight, a load. Paul clearly had a burden for others. He prayed continually. He loved deeply. He would go anywhere. He would give all and endure sufferings and hardships. That's the heart of God. To love what he loves and hate what he hates. You know, many Jews had thought Paul had turned on him, that he had abandoned his faith, 
It wasn't true. Nothing could have been further from the truth for Paul. Even the Christian Jews were telling Paul, you've got to go into the temple and basically act like a Jew to uh, assure them you haven't abandoned your faith to prove that you are still their brethren. He never uh, rejected his identification as a Jew. The great majority of the Jews were not saved. They rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And chapter 9, 10, and 11 all deal with Paul and, and God's role for the Jewish nation in salvation. Verse 2 again, for the Jews, he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish for their unbelieving heart. Jews were jealous for God. They wanted to please and honor God. Remember Saul did too? Who we know became Paul, the man that penned this. He was zealous for God, but that zeal was deadly and it was misplaced and going in the wrong direction. Paul now had a genuine, legitimate zeal, a concern over the blindness and increased hardening of their hearts. He longs for, he prays, he pleads for their salvation. Paul, his love was so great for his fellow countrymen that he was willing to go to the extreme. There was no limit to the sacrifice if it would mean some would be saved. This isn't the first time in the letter he's expressed his devotion, his love. Paul passionately said earlier on in Romans that he, he prayed for them unceasingly. He passionately loved the Lord, so he passionately loved people, all people, Jews, Gentiles, unsaved saved. He told the recipients of this letter, he prays without ceasing so I can come to you. He longs to see, strengthen, and encourage them. There was anguish over his spiritual condition of his fellow Jews to the most desperate degree. It reminded me, it's similar to when uh, Moses in the Old Testament, he had been meeting with God and he came down and he saw his people that they had made the calf. And when he saw that, he pleaded with God, oh God, but now if only you will forgive their sin, but if not, erase my name from the book of life. Paul couldn't, didn't need to, Moses couldn't, didn't need to. Jesus died once and for all. He was that blood, his shed blood, was the remission of sin. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ, and Christ alone, redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. There is no co-redemptor. Paul's not saying that. He knew Jesus was alone, the, our source of salvation, our redemption, our being right with God. Righteousness is through Christ alone. But he's, he's trying to articulate this burden is the most desperate degree. There's no length I wouldn't go to that my people would be saved. No greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend, and Paul would do that for the gospel. That Good Friday service, our friends heard so clearly the message of salvation, the gospel, yet no response. How? Paul wondered similarly when he thought of the Jews. In verse 4 and 5, he specifically cites unique blessings the privileges that God bestowed upon his people. He said, you've been the recipients, you've read, you've taught, you've memorized, you're, you've recorded, you've passed down, you've talked about these things that point to the Messiah, the genealogy, you are, you are alone in the genealogy for the Messiah. No other nation was chosen to be the recipients that could lay claim to those promises. Yet there was no response. How? 
Why? How could this be? Not only did they miss the Messiah, they called out, crucify him. That troubled, grieved, perplexed him. Did God's plan fail? Did he fail to make good on his promise? Was God not able to fulfill his plan? A resounding no, Paul would say. So as we wrap up the burden, we see God's plan in salvation is to give Paul, is to give us a burden for the lost, that we can't escape it, that we can't run from it, that there's no length that we won't go to in the hope and prayer and belief that some will be saved, that we we would care for others not just be content in our own salvation. Paul had that God-given burden his, for his people, his Jewish family. He would bear it for Christ, knowing ultimately all his concerns he would take to Jesus. Because in any burden in life, God allows us to have those but not to carry alone. We roll our burdens onto Christ. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give you is light. So we have this burden that we can't escape, but we roll it onto Jesus whose yoke is easy, whose burden is light. Well, now we'll transition to our second point, the backdrop. The backdrop. We homeschooled our kids, and when they were transitioning to uh, learning to read chapter books, um, if, they, if it was a heavy book that, that they were going to read, I would often read the first couple of chapters to them out loud. I wanted to make sure they got the setting, they knew the characters, and then with each chapter or maybe even a couple pages, I'd say, do you get it? Do you get it? <laughs> and depending on their level of understanding and appreciation for the author's writings, then they could run with it. And I knew they would enjoy the whole of the story more if they had it, um, if they knew the foundation, the backdrop of it. Nothing, there's nothing worse than being in the middle of the story, whether it's a book or a movie, walking in or picking up a book and thinking, well, I don't know what's going on. Of course you don't know what's going on. You have to start at the beginning. And we can't just pull out some things from this chapter and say, well, I I don't get what's going on. So we have to look at the backdrop. And I think that's what Paul's doing here too. The backdrop in these verses is the sovereignty of God in scripture. Sovereignty, kind of to sum it up, God's everything. He's omniscient, that means he's all-knowing. He's omnipotent, he's all-powerful and omnipresent. He's always present. He's outside of time. If we go to the beginning, the backdrop in scripture is Genesis. In the beginning, God was there and he created something out of nothing. He's outside of time. He's the creator and sustainer of everything to this moment in time for all of eternity. The power and wisdom to prevent or allow anything to occur are for reasons all his own. He has a purpose in all he does and all he allows. Verse 6, Paul goes back to the word of God, the backdrop. It's not as if the word of God has failed. Their rejection, it's not as if God's word has failed He is entirely faithful, God is, and he keeps his promises. Their rejection cannot be traced to God's inability or neglect. He's faithful, he's powerful. And the rest of the chapter, as Paul's able to step back and remind himself and the readers and we are reminded today, that's the backdrop. 
God is entirely faithful. He is sovereign all the time. And so then Paul can anchor his hopes, his desires, what he doesn't understand into that truth, onto the sovereignty of God. Verses 6 to 29, remember Paul's writing to Roman believers. The Jewish believers, he's saying, they could, or the Jewish believers can now see all the promises point to Jesus as their Messiah. And for the Gentiles, everything was new to them. The fact that they knew of these promises now and that they're grafted in and that they are the recipients now of such hope because of Jesus. Paul wanted all to know and be reminded of what God has done in the past. So he gives us the backdrop the background to Israel's history and God speaking through it all. I'm going to read just a couple verses, 6b to 8. For not all who are descendants from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. Paul said the same in chapter 2. He says, just because you're circumcised doesn't mean you're a true Jew. Jacob, whose name God changed to Israel, just kind of give you some background here, the backdrop, and all the descendants that would come from him would form the nation of Israel. The name Israel means governed by God. And Paul's saying, not everyone who calls themselves a Jew, who would identify themselves as being Israel, want to be or are governed by God. The same can be true of Christians. Not everyone who says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and and identifies themselves maybe in checking off a box, I'm a Christian, because I'm not these other things. But do they want to be governed by, identified with Christ as bearing that holy name, Jesus Christ? Old Testament names here that Paul mentions, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God had made and reaffirmed his covenant promise to each of these three generations. The Jews had the promises and the patriarchs, all the blessings of protection, provision, him guiding them, being with them, being their God. They would be his people. They were all available to this nation if they would follow him, if they would be governed by him, if they would obey him with their whole hearts, souls, minds, and spirits. God made and reaffirmed the covenant to these three generations. The Lord initiated and bound himself to these promises. God worked in unexpected ways all throughout scripture. And here, Paul is mentioning the firstborn, not necessarily the one where the promise would be passed on to. God chose Isaac. Isaac was the child of the promise, but not the firstborn. Ishmael, Abraham's son with with Hagar, he got impatient and in the flesh hurried God's promise along. And that's not the way the promise would be passed on. God chose Jacob and not Esau, again, not the firstborn for the promise to be passed on, to receive the blessing. God had the knowledge and the authority to act apart from expectations. He still does. And the backdrop again, as we step back, God's sovereign. He knows all. He's in all. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. The word of God has not 
nor ever will fail. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but the word of God will endure forever, and the word of God will always accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. He fulfills his promises, his way. He knows all things. So, Paul's burden to see the lost save, the backdrop, God's sovereignty with the nation of Israel, working in ways that they wouldn't expect because he's God and he knows all. He's sovereign. Thirdly, we get to the bottom line. Salvation from God's perspective. There's mankind's response to God's salvation and God's work in it all. Again, we see his sovereignty here. Salvation from God's perspective and our perspective. He's always righteous and he's always just. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. God's sovereign choice will always prove to be right, whether we see it or not. God is a God of both mercy and judgment. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18, he says, Shall the Lord not do what is just? Charles Spurgeon says, The Christian believes him, speaking of God, to be too wise to err and too good to be unkind. He trusts him where he cannot trace him. He looks up to him in the darkest hour, and believes that all is well. It's been said probably more modern translation or interpretation of this, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Step back, trust God. He's working from his perspective, salvation. Remember in context, we're talking about the salvation of the Jews, okay? So God is working when we can't see, trust his heart. We all would agree that God works in wonderful and mysterious ways, right? Yeah? Amen. When I was working on this part and just typing it out. I just, my mind just um, raced through big and little examples in scripture of where I just thought, well, I didn't expect that or I didn't see that coming. And so in no particular order, as I was typing this out, the poor widow that Elisha encountered, she had nothing. And Elisha says, well, go get some jars. And then the Lord filled every jar that she brought to him. That was his provision. The accounts of Jonah, the big fish, you know, his disobedience, and then God puts him in a big fish. Job. Oh, wow. Joseph, falsely imprisoned, accused, but God meant for his purpose what man wanted to try to destroy with his. In creation, Marvel at creation. Still in creation, he does things in such splendid, powerful, awesome ways. Moses, his whole life from being in that river to leading the nation of Israel and then not being able to step into the promised land. Didn't see that coming, you know? Jericho, such a big, formidable fortress and they just marched around obediently and then shouted blew the trumpets David and Goliath Daniel in the lion's den God sending Jesus the miraculous conception of Jesus and then born into such poverty to such a young mama his miracles Jesus's miracles spit in the mud and and make someone see not healing Lazarus, but raising him from the dead. Didn't see that coming. Nor did Mary and Martha. His life, death, and resurrection. Stunning providence. Sovereignty in our own lives. Can we figure it out? Can we see it? Can we understand it? No, we can't. 
Think of a snowfall, whether it's a light snowfall or a fierce snowstorm. It's made up of individual snowflakes that until photography and microscopes, we didn't know how each one is individually fashioned, unique, and the sum total of them all just is a blanket of white beauty. But if we try to capture a snowflake and see in detail with our naked eye the intricacies and the beauty and the uniqueness of each one that makes up the sum total, it's going to fade. We're not able to comprehend what God is able to do and does all around us. But we can believe and see with eyes of faith. So in these verses, Paul wisely turns to scripture for perspective in this burden of his soul. Verses 15 to 27, I'm only going to read 15 and 16. He says to Moses, I'm going to have mercy on who I have mercy. And I will have compassion on who I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or emotion or exertion, but on God who has mercy. God always has and will continue to work in wisdom and his holy ways, not known to us. We delight to see answered prayers, absolutely. We pray specifically and we, we declare Ephesians 3.20. Oh, he has done exceedingly and abundantly above what we could ask or think for his glory. But he doesn't always work that way. But his ways are just as mighty and powerful and good. He's sovereign. He doesn't need to explain himself to us. We don't need to know why. We'd impose our own judgment in his decision. Salvation is based solely on God's mercy. His grace, according to his will, brought about by his power and spirit. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift. It's not deserved. We deserve hell, right? We deserve hell. It's not by merit. Uh, what we exert, what we do, it's mercy. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. We boast alone in what Jesus has done. There's no boasting. Salvation is a gift. Moses and Pharaoh, to Moses, God extended mercy. To Pharaoh, his judgment. You know, maybe you didn't like reading this, not understanding it. But if you go back to the original text, 20 times uh, the scripture says Pharaoh hardened, his heart was hardened. 10 times it was Pharaoh hardening his heart. Ten times it was God hardening his heart. Different usage of words. And God was ratifying. God was proving what was there. You know, he allowed Pharaoh to go on this rebellious way. So he used it for his glory. He confirmed what was already there. God's heart is like 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not wishing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. Ezekiel 18, 23. Do you think I like to see the wicked die? Says the sovereign Lord, of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. That's the heart of God. Either I believe in his attributes and his holiness or not. Verse 22 is Paul articulating a possible question? Well, does God create people just to send them to hell? He's sovereign. He could. But keep in mind from God that God is righteous. He is just. He is good. And again, we go back to those other scriptures. He's not willing that anyone would perish, but all would come to repentance. I have to, by faith, regardless of if I understand it or not, believe that God is good and just. Paul's focusing on the sovereignty of God in this passage of the letter, but we can't dismiss the heart of God in scriptures as well. Salvation from God's perspective. He's just, 
He's wisely and perfectly extending mercy and compassion. He, like the potter Paul references in Jeremiah, is fashioning vessels for his honor, for his glory. He has allowed all who believe as Jews and Gentiles to partake of the promises of God. Okay, the last portion of our message this morning, the sovereignty of God also allows for mankind to exercise our free will. They both work together. So bottom line continued, man's response, to believe or not, to respond or ignore, to receive or reject. Salvation is available to the Jew and the Gentile now through Jesus. Verses 9 to 33, I'm not going to read that. You studied that well. God revealed himself to both the Jews and the Gentiles. To the Jews, he says, I'm right there. I'm right in your path. But they walk around. They stumble over them, over him, in their attempt to attain the righteousness of God by self-righteousness. They missed the Messiah. Their failure to recognize the Messiah is because they sought their own justification. Remember, that's being right with God through the law, not by faith. The path of salvation is the same for each. It's only through Jesus. How each group, how each individual, the Jew, the Gentile, right down to the individual, makes up the church. Christ is either the rock in whom I build my life on or in the way. He he reveals himself to all and the choice is all, all ours, and we're all without excuse. Paul had a burden and in conclusion, my takeaway as I pondered this man's burden I want to imitate him in this way, as he imitated Christ. I'm thankful for the blessings, the challenge, and timeliness of studying and teaching this chapter. Because it's, it's timely for me in the urgency of it. Um, I've often in my messages mentioned my family my seven brothers and sisters who I love dearly, and my very big extended family. And on December 29th, number seven sibling, Martha, went home to be with Jesus. Very unexpectedly, she died um, watching a Hallmark movie on her sofa. Just had turned 63. Perfect health. She ate better than any of us. Um, My dad died at the same age. Uh, It was a shock to all of us. She was alone, but she died peacefully and went right into the arms of her Savior. But when Jeff and I went back for that funeral, there were 75 members of my family that were there, my immediate family, my siblings, their children, and now the next generation. There is an urgency I feel, I know, is a God-given burden. We loved family reunions, and Martha was always the one that would plan them. And isn't it interesting? She's the first one there. But I know by what I've heard from some of my family members, they will not be in heaven in their condition right now. This came out of the blue, but God's sovereign. His ways are higher. I trust him. I rest in that. He is good and does good. But what am I left to do with that? Be content with the Romans 8? Or have that burden, like Paul, to pray for the lost? So in conclusion, what does it mean to have a burden for the lost? The deepest passion and longing in our soul for others to be saved. First, you care. It's a bold question. Do you think about, do you care that people you know, people you don't know, your family, strangers, are not facing 
an eternity with Christ in heaven just the opposite? They're destined for hell? Or do you stay in that context of just knowing God works all things together for the good and nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ and I thank God that that is in the scriptures because I lean on that all the time. But I can't stay there for me alone. It's been said, people don't know how much you care until they, uh, how much you know, let me rephrase that. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You gotta care. You gotta care. And then a commitment. Pray. And this is a commitment to intercede, to get up in the middle of the night and get on your face before the Lord for however he burdens you. Maybe it's for those little babies that our nation is saying is okay to kill at any stage in life. It's wrong all the way. What is the burden? Do you have a burden from God for the lost? Tim Keller said, our prayer lives, whether we pray and what we pray, tend to reveal what truly lies in our heads and hearts. You gotta intercede with those groanings. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Salvation is always a work of the Holy Spirit. We cannot save anyone, but we can and are called to share Christ's love. Commit to that. Plant seeds. Reach out. Be the hands and feet of Christ. Thirdly, it takes courage to press on, to persevere in the face of rejection, persecution, to know and share the truth in a culture that increasingly rejects and hates Jesus and all things of the word of God, all things Christianity, to not be moved by public opinion, by fear or weakness on your part, to put on the whole armor of God and advance for the kingdom of God, to sacrifice time and resources to support missionary work and the gospel proclamation. Do you know we're approaching 30 years at Anaheim Stadium? Do you care? Do you care that there's a whole bunch of people that haven't been there the first 29 or that have fallen away? Do you care that the gospel is ever increasingly under attack, the church is under attack. It takes courage to rise up and support and be a part of this revival, this awakening that we're praying for. It takes courage to, in love, call out sin for what it is, but you don't stay there. You stick around and disciple and love on and hold accountable and care. And then finally, continue. We've got to continue to grow in the Lord, in your own trust and obedience and the pursuit of holiness, in looking more like Jesus, in never giving up hope, whether we understand what and how God is working or not. And as I close in prayer this morning, I'm going to pray for us all to just open our hands, our heart, our lives, our strength to carrying on this burden for the lost, for the babies, for the kingdom of God like never before. Pray with me, please. Dear Jesus, you say, you promise that if we pray according to your will, we have what we ask for. And Lord, I am praying, and I know this is your will, that we have a heart that is broken for what breaks yours, that we care, that we will commit to pray, that we'll have the courage, that we will press on, continue on, in our trust and obedience and our reflection of you, Jesus. Make us that salt and light. Bring that revival, that awakening across our nation like never before. And Jesus, we pray it begins with us right now, right here. And we pray this in faith, believing you've heard and you've answered.
even greater than we could have believed. In Jesus' name, amen.